there's some pretty good evidence that this event occurred. So I, I find it really weird that, you know, there's just not enough, uh, that there just isn't enough, uh, um, uh, you know, information about it in the world. But so here I am, this is my role and my job to give it to people. So, <clears throat> so President Eisenhower's meeting with gray aliens from the perspective of the great alien agenda. This is the outline of just this portion of the presentation. Uh, the origin of the story, uh, where it comes from, the sources, I'm going to talk a bit about how we know, like, why is this in our mythology, in the UFO mythology? Um, the description of really pretty much what most people think occurred, uh, the apparent agreement. Could there be an agreement with greys? You know, we, I get emails sometimes, and these people are, like, upset that, like, the greys are evil beings. And my whole perspective is, listen, they're responding to us. We've done something with them and now they're doing these abductions. And so that's always been my perspective. And so it looks to me like there's an agreement and I go through um, some evidence that seems to say that this is what people thought the agreement is. And then the, then the UFO and abduction phenomenon takes a certain type of uh, character or perspective over this decades as they move on. And it really does seem to look like there was maybe some kind of arrangement or agreement. It, I, it seems obvious to me that this exists. And um, so I have a bunch of stuff I want to share there. It's not all that's too long, so don't, it doesn't, it's looking overwhelming, but don't worry, it's not too long. And then at the end, at the end, I kind of say the error of our ways. It's my theory as human evolution goes, what we've done or what, what has gone wrong in our evolution and where, uh, and where, why I think the greys are kind of involving themselves in this way. So um, during my research, I'd stumbled upon a story that President Eisenhower met with aliens on February 20th and 21st of 1954. This story sounded like a great fabrication for a nice conspiracy theory. Don't forget, I was a normal guy, MBA and banks and all that stuff, never coming into this. So when I heard this story, um, it seems to catch my attention. And it was because it was not with just gray or weird aliens. If someone was trying to grab attention. You'd think they would make up something really fantastical, but it's with humanoids. And I thought that was really strange. And I'd already learned that there were humanoids in the abduction phenomenon. And so why would you make up humanoids? Like, why would you do that if you're, if you're making things up? So right away, that, that just captured my attention. Like, what? Meeting with humanoid aliens? That was really weird. And humanoid aliens would become a part of the abduction phenomenon. Coincidentally, a famous UFO sighting that involved humanoids occurred in the same year as the apparent Eisenhower meeting in 1954. Jesse uh, Rosenberg uh, and her two children in Staffordshire, England, witnessed two blonde-looking humanoids inside a craft that was floating on their property. After they locked eyes, the craft and its occupants quickly flew away. And the most credible abduction story of them all, Kravis Walton, who was abducted for five days, recalls interacting with blonde humanoids. I myself have seen humanoids. The story that Eisenhower met with humanoids comes from both circumstantial and testimonial evidence. Dr. Michael Sala, a former American University professor who now runs the Peace Ambassador Program at AU's Center for Global Peace, has gathered comprehensive evidence of this possible meeting. And he's created a research paper that's actually available online at his website. Um, oops, I didn't want to do that. Let's back out. Uh, right here. So I just want to show that it's available for everyone. Everyone wants to do their, their research. This guy did, did all the good research. So uh, that's available there and you can study that for yourself. Um, so Dr. Michael Sala on his website there. So we first hear that President Eisenhower met with a race of aliens in a private letter dated April 16th, 1954, written by Gerald Light and Mead Lane. So this is the letter also available on the web. So you can do your own research and look at this letter. So this is a very interesting letter. Gerald Light was a well-known writer and lecturer in the metaphysical community. And Mead Lin was the director of Borderland Sciences Research Associates, a parapsychology and psychic research institute. Light gives details of a first contact event that he witnessed between an alien race of humanoids and, and high-ranking government and military men. He had come with several community leaders that were brought in to help gauge the response of the public. He describes a scene of concern and anxiety of these leaders. The letter is available at the, on the Borderland Sciences Research Foundation. So here it is here, you can see it here. And Dr. Michael Sala actually does a really good job researching who these people are that, that uh, Gerald Light mentions and would they you know, be typical for uh, community leaders to be brought in uh, to, to, to gauge uh, humans' reactions to aliens. Uh, so he, Michael Sala kind of researches all the names involved, and he does actually conclude that you know this these could be general uh, these could be good people as uh, that the public or that a government would use 
to gauge the 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 how humans would re respond to it. So the date of 1954, sorry, the date of, uh, uh, of February 20th, 21st, 1954, for this meeting um, seems likely, but it is hard to know for certain. The Dwight D. Eisenhower Library in Alberdeen, in Al uh, Aberdeen, Kansas, does mention that on the night of February 20th, 1954, Eisenhower made an unscheduled departure from the Smoking Tree Branch in Palm Springs, where he was staying. The next morning, he attended a church service in Los Angeles. That morning, a spokesperson announced that he had been taken to the dentist. And then at the later gathering, he people meet the dentist and say, oh, Eisenhower was at the dentist and here's the dentist. But when researchers, UFO researchers, try to investigate the dentist office, there isn't any records of Eisenhower at this dentist. And uh, UFO researcher William Moore points out that the nature of the vacation is also really strange because if you're going to Palm Springs, uh, it was he was just out of vacation recently within a within a week prior. So and Palm Springs is actually a really easy drive to uh, Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, that's where it's Smoking Tree Ranch. And I actually just checked it out myself. It's two and two and a half hours. So yeah, Eisenhower definitely could have you know made a trip that night, uh, which is off record as he's gone to the dentist, and he could have actually gone to uh, to Edwards Air Force Base. Um, What's also weird about that night is that the Associated Press reported that President Eisenhower had died. <laughs> so then they retracted the statement. And the death of a president is not something that small. Like you don't just accidentally say that the president died. And why that happened is unclear. It's like not clear why they did that. So um, lastly, Gerald White's letter, the one that I referred to, uh, to Mead Lynn, gives testimony that it's at Edwards Air Force Base in Palm Springs, or sorry, when Eisenhower was on vacation in Palm Springs, when he went to Edwards Air Force Base and participated in a first contact event. So who are these sources? The next evidence comes from the testimony from career officials, uh, whether from they're from in the government or the military. And as servicemen seem to retire, they seem to be you know more willing to uh, speak about what they know. Um, and these people put their reputation. So one thing that should be noted for all the people I'm going to mention today, they all have service records of some kind of professional service record. You don't just go talking about UFOs and aliens, man, uh, when you have a service record because you just tarnish your, your, your career. So they really do put their reputations on the line when they do this kind of stuff. And there are actually consequences that so they do threaten themselves by doing this. In December of 1953, the Joint Chiefs of Staff issued Army Navy Air Force publication 146, which is actually online, uh, criminalizing anyone uh, in the Air Force or, or, you know, in the Army talking about UFOs. So even just to talk about UFOs, you can get, you can get uh, uh, fined for $10,000 and, and uh, jailed up for 10 years. So uh, that's going to, um, you know, keep people from actually talking about it. Uh, so in regards to testimony uh, of individuals who were there at the meeting, Colonel Philip Corso, a highly decorated officer that served in Eisenhower's National Security Council alluded he was there uh, when a treaty was signed by the now Eisenhower administration with extraterrestrials. Also, Charles L. Suggs, who was a former commander of the U.S. Navy, attended the first contact meeting at Evers Air Force Base. And uh, that's according to his son. And there are also plenty of whistleblowers who have gone on record with their knowledge of classified information. So they've, they've learned about it somehow peripherally within their circle and they add more information. So for example, John Lear, uh, who uh, some may know as the, uh, he's the son of William Lear, the inventor of the, of the Lear jet. Uh, and so John Lear is a Lockheed captain, a Lockheed L1011 captain who flew over 150 test craft. He's a friend of the CIA director and he's gone on record with his knowledge of the meeting of extraterrestrials and uh, that it occurred at Edwards Air Force Base. Phil Schneider, um, a former geological engineer, was employed by corporations contracted to build underground bases. And he worked, uh, uh, so he's mentioned it as well too. Uh, Dr. Michael Wolf, a scientific consultant for presidents, claimed to have served on various policymaking committees responsible for extraterrestrial affairs for 20 years, 25 years, sorry. He claimed that Eisenhower administration entered into a treaty with an extraterrestrial race and that this treaty was never ratified as constitutionally required. Also, former Pentagon and UFO, US Con Congress consultant Timothy Good claims to know that Eisenhower had three meetings with extraterrestrial beings, and one of those locations was Edwards Air Force Base. Bill Kirkin, a uh, medic at Holloman Air Force Base in 1955, uh, what Kirkland knew was that Eisenhower was at 
uh, Holloman Air Force Base while his friends, uh, same day, were witnessing a UFO on the base, had come in and landed on the base, and that Eisenhower had walked into the, uh, into the UFO. Um, and then there are those who have witnessed classified documentation. So people have actually seen documents. And one of those is Don Phillips, uh, Air Force serviceman and employee on secret aviation projects. Uh, William, and William Cooper is, on, is kind of controversial and, and he is well known for having written a book um, and where he saw declassified briefings uh, as a naval, naval intelligence uh, officer. And, uh, and that would happen in between the years 1970 and 1973. So between all the testimonies, there are some discrepancies, but the com commonalities between them describe a general picture of what occurred. So here's my interpretation. Apparently, President Eisenhower <clears throat> and a group of high-level government and military personnel and chosen community leaders had gathered at Edwards Air Force Base on the night of February 20th, 1954. Over a period of 48 hours, they were part of a con first contact event with the alien humanoids from another solar system, representing their species. Navy Commander Charles L. Suggs had claimed the aliens were two white humanoid Nordic looking humanoids with pale blue eyes and colorless lips. It is interesting to imagine if there were any niceties or displays of courteous behavior between either species. And did the humanoid aliens speak in telepathy? Did they speak in group telepathy? From experience, I notice highly evolved beings, whether they are humanoids or greys, sometimes have similar behavior. My experience with the greys is they always cut to the chase and avoid small talk. So it could be imagined this happened that night. In a dialogue, apparently the aliens asked questions about America's nuclear testing and requested that humans stop using nuclear weapons, stop nuclear testing and dismantle their nuclear armory. And it could be presumed that, America, that they came to America as a world leader and that this request was meant for the planet. They said that they could help with this process. According to Gerald White, that night he saw five different UFOs being studied and analyzed by Air Force officials with the help and assistance of the humanoids. Possibly this was the first time humans were, in an official capacity were witnessing their thought controlled crafts. At some point the humans asked for an exchange of technology. The humanoids expressed their desire for humanity to become more spiritual. According to William Cooper, the humanoids refused to exchange technology, citing that we were unspiritually unable to handle the technology we then possessed. They believed that we would use any new technology to destroy each other. He continued, this race stated that we were on a path of self-destruction and we must stop killing each other, stop polluting the earth, stop raping the earth's natural resources and learn to live in harmony. Importantly, with the Gray's ability to see future timelines, it could be assumed this warning was from actual knowledge of a future event and not a moral opinion. Instead of a technology exchange, the humanoids wanted us humans to focus on our spiritual development. What that may mean, uh, what they mean by spiritual development is unclear, but it appears the humanoids may have demonstrated something about their potential and the spiritual powers to the humans in the room. Gerald White wrote, the reality of the other plain aeroforms is now and forevermore removed from the realms of speculation and made a rather painful part of the consciousness of every, science, every responsible scientific and political group. In some instances, I could not stifle a wave of pity that arose in my own being as I watched the pathetic bewilderment of rather brilliant brains struggling to make some sort of rational explanation, which would enable them to remain, retain their familiar theories and concepts. And I thanked my own destiny for having long ago pushed me into the metaphysical woods and compelled me to find my way out. I had forgotten how commonplace things as dematerialization of solid objects had become to my own mind. The coming and going of an etheric or spirit body has been so familiar to me these many years, I had forgotten that such a manifestation could snap the mental balance of a man not so conditioned. I shall never forget those 48 hours at Muroc, which is Edwards Air Force Base. So it appears they may have removed their spirit energy from their body, or maybe they turned themselves into orbs, all things and other, all things myself and other contactees have seen of the greys. Some have seen greys also manipulate matter. So this could have been a live demonstration, possibly to show the true nature of the universe as a spiritual one. General Gerald White described the atmosphere of the meeting. I've never seen so many human beings in a state of complete collapse and confusion as they realized that their own world had indeed ended with such finality as to beggar description. 
light describes an event filled with panic and confusion of those present and a large difference of opinion in regards to telling the public and to how to respond to these off-world visitors. The humanoids go on to warning, go on to warn humans about the greys. Their message seems to have been something along the lines of, let us help you become more spiritual and disarm your nuclear weapons. Otherwise the greys will have to involve themselves. Kind of like that's the premise of how they, what they were saying. In hindsight, this could have, what we know now, for what they told me now, in hindsight, this could have meant, let us help your society become more spiritual, or else the greys in their hybrid program is the only other option. Or maybe put, a receding of the population is the only other option. But possibly the hybrid program was never mentioned. Either way, the greys were pitted as the bad cop of the scenario. William Cooper wrote, these terms were met with suspicion, especially the major condition of nuclear disarmament. It was believed that meeting that condition would leave us helpless in the face of an obvious alien threat. We also had nothing in history with which to make the decision. So nuclear disarmament was not considered to be within the best interest of the United States. The overtures were rejected. It was perceived by most testimonies that the, hum that the humanoids warned the humans of the greys and they would help them with the exchange of letting them help them, they would help them with the exchange by helping them become more spiritual. The agreement with the greys. <clears throat> so eventually at some unknown time, a second meeting occurred between Eisenhower and the gray aliens and an agreement was reached. According to Cooper, the treaty stated that the aliens would not interfere in our affairs and we would not interfere with theirs. We would keep their presence on earth a secret. They would furnish us with advanced technology and would help us in, uh, in our technological development. They would not make any treaty with any other earth nation. They could abduct humans on a limited and periodic basis for the purpose of medical examinations and monitoring our development with a stipulation that the humans would not be harmed, would be returned to their point of abduction, would have no memory of the event and that the alien nation would furnish Majesty 12 with a list of all human contactees and abductees on a regular scheduled basis. According to Philip Schneider, this treaty with the gray aliens circumvented the constitution of the United States. It was never ratified as was constitutionally required. The treaty was called the 1954 Grieta Treaty. Significantly, a number of whistleblowers argued that the treaty was signed, that was signed involved some coercion on part of the extraterrestrials. According to documentation, Don Phillips had read there was some idea the greys asked if we would allow them to, to be here to do research. I have read that our reply was, well, how can we stop you? You are so advanced. Colonel Phil, uh, Philip Corso, a highly decorated officer that served in Eisenhower's National Security Council, <clears throat> wrote in his memoirs, we had negotiated a kind of surrender with the extraterrestrials. As long as we couldn't fight them, they dedicated the terms because they knew what we feared was disclosure. The overall sentiment was one of distrust of the greys and that humans kind of negotiated a surrender. According to Cooper, by 1954, it became obvious that the aliens had deceived Eisenhower and had broken the treaty. It was suspected that the aliens were not submitting a complete list of human contactees and abductees in their Majesty 12. And it was suspected that not all human, not all abductees had been returned. Lear suggested a deal was struck that in exchange for advanced technology from the aliens, we would allow them to abduct a very small number of persons and we would periodically be given a list of those persons abducted. We got something less than the technology we bargained for and found the abductions exceeded by a million fold than we, want, than we had naively agreed to. So here's mine. Could this exist? Could this be real? Could these all be confusions? Could these be fabrications? Some features of this testimony about an agreement between Eisenhower and gray aliens do seem to define the UFO abduction phenomenon that would precede 1954. So apparently before 1954, I don't have too much record of this, but the abductions before 1954 apparently were, were, were they call them the spaceman abductions, where they actually, the, the, the craft comes down and the human interacts with the alien and the alien says, come, come to our, check out our ship. And the, they fly them around, they'll fly them to space and it's kind of fun. And then it seems to be really after 54 that there, there actually seems to be a noticeable change. And you really do get the first contact event being the Benny and, Betty and Barney Hill story, right? Um, and it seems to be the beginning of it all. It really like seems to have the stamp. And that's of course, after 1954. But we know something about Betty and Barney Hill's abduction story now. And it comes from uh, at least, I, I read it in David Jacobs' book, The Threat, um, that there was a semen extraction done on um, Barney. And that wasn't actually made public, not until much, much, much later. And Betty, we know also in the story, was uh, that was checked to see if she was pregnant. 
So this was always about the hybrid program. And I'm, it could even be asked why, like I'm struck with something here, some kind of misinformation that's going on here. Why would any curious scientifically focused species need to conduct so many medical examinations? Why is it being termed that way? Because it could be assumed Eisenhower and his team may have asked these same questions. I'm troubled to believe that the possibility of an, with the possibility of an alien threat, that Eisenhower's team did not seek more information about these apparent medical examinations. In no science in our human world do we take humans, hundreds of thousands of possibly millions of examinations of any single thing that we are studying. We don't do that in any science. We don't take hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of those things. We actually try to preserve the thing with which we're taking. So to call them medical examinations was also very suspicious. By taking sperm and genetic sampling of so many humans, would be characteristic of trying to model the genetics of an entire population, something you might do if you were reseeding that population. We may never know if the hybrid program was ever mentioned in this possible agreement, or if it was ever communicated to the leadership. Maybe the, the Greys actually left it out, or maybe they didn't. Maybe they do know it. Maybe there's a body who actually knows exactly what's going on. Regardless of whistleblower testimonies, it seems we don't have enough information about on whether whether the agreed upon uh, agreement uh, has any type of level of knowledge about the hybrid program. <clears throat> Another feature that defines this period is the request to disarm nuclear weapons. The idea of humanoids wanting humans to disengage our nuclear weapons is consistent with the UFO sightings that will occur over the next several decades. Um, I recommend anybody who's into this uh, field or who has who's just exploring it for the first time, watch this documentary. It is a fantastic documentary and uh, uh, by, uh, by Robert Hastings. It basically you learn that all of the nuclear silo uh, in America have had uh, UFO experiences and, uh, and it's really kept secret and it's really telling. And a lot of them are in some cases, they turn on the nuclear weapons or turn them off. And they really seem to be um, kind of like agitating the, the you know, basically a, sh a UFO shows up and then they do something to turn on or turn off the nuclear weapon, showing that they have the possibility to interact with them. And uh, so it's a very fantastic documentary and I recommend anyone kind of, uh, uh, you know, watching this stuff. Um, and there's a plenty of abduction cases as well too, where humans are told by the beings, they don't like, uh, the, the beings don't like humans in their nuclear weaponry. And, uh, or they also don't like the nuclear destruction. And in some cases, the beings actually communicate, it can be felt in other places, other dimensions and other spaces. So th that's clear that there's some kind of dislike with our destruction and they tied it in today with my contact event as well too. Um, uh, that's all you know, part of the destruction part, right? Like we are, humans are doing this. A possible technology exchange. <clears throat> um, that seems consistent as well too. Uh, we know, uh, if you ever watch this, if you read Bob Lazar's story, it's clear that there's some type of, the government has their hands on some type of technology. Um, and also uh, astrophysicist Eric Davis, uh, who worked as a consultant for the Pentagon in a July 23rd, 2020 New York Times article claimed he gave a classified briefing to a defense department agency about materials he had worked on from off-world vehicles not made on this earth. So looking pretty consistent that there is an exchange of technology. Uh, the one that I think is really interesting is that, again, when people are saying they're kind of angry at the greys, well, there's something going on because there's clear communication between gray aliens and the governments. Um, so, and so I just find that really telling that there's some kind of some kind of consistent communication going on. Um, for example, you'll see uh, there's a really good UFO sighting, the Westall sighting of April 6, 1966. It was the biggest mass sighting in Australia with over 200 witnesses observing three UFOs that floated over an elementary school. Pictures were taken. It landed on a nearby field and then flew away. Yet within 20 minutes of the sighting, two army trucks filled with dozens of soldiers appeared and collected and erased evidence. A high degree of secrecy immediately followed. The soldiers were identified not just as Australian military, but also the United States Air Force. So a quote from Colonel Neil Smith in Carmel McClune's documentary, Westall 66, A Suburban UFO Mystery, reveals the strange speed with which the cover-up occurred. See, he says, the UFO sighting had to be something that we were working on. We knew all about it. We were in on it. 
even though we might not have known the detail. The fact is, whoever it was, the authorities responded so quickly, so rapidly, they had just been sitting on their trucks with the engine going. So there's, I, I know there's mysteries like this all over the place, where there, someone on the inside is aware of this information and there's communication going on. So it looks pretty apparent that that could be really true, that there's this constant communication. Um, I kind of lean towards the idea that you can see the way they handle UFO contact events uh, as almost witness, uh, almost knowledge that they have some kind of other information. Um, so we'll never know how real an agreement is between an American government and gray aliens, but a meeting similar to the one that has so far been described would explain why the American government handles UFOs so secretively in comparison to other countries. It's almost like they know something they don't want the population to know. For example, the Belgian wave of UFO sightings that occurred between 1989 and 1991. During the UFO flap, government authorities cooperated with witnesses and civilian research groups. There were over 2,000 UFO reports and often involving large triangulars with triangular craft with multiple witnesses, including police officers. The Air Force investigated 650 of the reports, 500 they agreed to be known of an unknown craft. So the Air Force, civilian groups, and the government all worked together. Uh, the investigation was uh, coordinated by Ma uh, Major General Wilf Wilfred de Brouwer, Chief Operations of the Belgian Air Force, and he spoke openly that the crafts witnessed were of an unknown origin, and that to fully understand them, there should be better cooperation within the government. So very in contrast, uh, we also have, uh, well, you have other generals on, on, I have another quote here from a Spanish general who actually agrees, uh, who also themselves in 1970s is on quote saying, you know, uh, we're studying this stuff. We're very interested in UFOs. We're very, we, and he said, personally, I believe they're actually aliens from another planet. <laughs> so you have this 1970s Spanish general also kind of openly saying it um, in contrast to the Americans, right? The nations, uh, so you have uh, uh, this, the 1966 Portage County UFO sighting where the officers chased a uh, UFO for 86 miles, but it went down and think the, uh, uh, the Blue Book Project that the police officers were following of the, the moon Venus, sorry, the planet Venus, right? Like that's the denial, if that's what it is, right? It's this fierce denial. It's, it's not like you, you can see how other countries respond and then you can look at fierce denial. And then you have the same thing with the Condon Committee report. In 1966, the Condon Committee to study the UFO phenomenon, which was financed by the United States Air Force. And then there was a leak. Right? It was revealed through leaked memos that the community was created to purposely mislead the public, purposely debunk the UFO phenomenon, and yet appear objective. So again, there's something, there's, there's weird, there's purposeful cover-up, and it says that they may have more information that, that they don't want people to know. And so I actually think it looks like some people on the inside see it as a threat. And, uh, and I think the agenda is complex. I think if... I think it's important to understand this agenda as, uh, as you know, what everything I learned today or what I presented today shows that the being's agenda is, is could be terrifying and could be scary and, and also is positive. So it's this weird twist. And I think that's the complex nature of it. And I think there's no wisdom from humans on how to handle that. And uh, so is it possible that those who know, know the agenda? In October of 1955, the mayor of Naples uh, famously relayed a private conversation he had with American General Douglas MacArthur to the press saying that the general expressed a belief the people of Earth might find themselves facing an extraterrestrial threat and that the Earth would have to unite to survive against a common attack from a people from another planet. The next day, the Chicago Tribune ran MacArthur Fear Space War. So that's 1955, just a year after this apparent meeting, right? So that's a really suspicious thing to say. In 1962, MacArthur made a statement implying the possibility of future interplanetary conflict. You now face a new world, a world of change. We speak in strange terms of harnessing the cosmic energy of ultimate conflict between a united human race and the sinister forces of some other planetary galaxy. In 1997, Ronald Reagan addressed the United Nations, famously saying, I occasionally think how quickly our differences worldwide would vanish if we were facing an alien threat from outside this world. <clears throat> Luis Elizondo from the Pentagon UFO program when he was running, ATIP, 
um, was shut down in part because the evangelical Christian beliefs of those hires in the program. George Knapp, an investigative journalist who worked alongside Luis Elizondo tweeted, a cabal of religious fundamentalists inside the national security apparatus believes UFOs and paranormals are satanic. And by studying them, we risk inviting Satan into our world. Nick Pope, a former UFO investigator with the UK's De Ministry of Defense, claimed to also have experienced senior government officials whose belief in God and demonic forces prevented further government action in the investigation into UFOs. So there seems to be an obvious push and pull between whatever forces within the level of government know exactly what's going on and versus uh, maybe, there, maybe like there's also clear good intentions. I imagine these beings, these people who are interacting with these beings know the kind of the, the behavior of them. And there, that also seems to be the case too, because you get strange contact events where, uh, so for example, with the, the nuclear weapons, uh, Robert Salas was one of the generals who was overlooking 10 ICBMs and, uh, uh, sorry, 10 ICMs, and uh, they all of a sudden got activated when there was a UFO outside. Uh, no, they all got shut down. There's another case. It's this one here, the uh, 1966 Minot Air Force Base. From a distance, nuclear weapons were activated. So the way that these UFOs are interacting with the nuclear armory, and then the way that the government doesn't do anything about it, the, the, the strange, like, it just shows that their intentions are understood. That's what I see with that. I saw that, they, that there was a clear, like, they got the intentions. They recognize that the beings aren't just going to want to nuclear, to, you know, if someone didn't know the, the story, what's to stop any general or any politician from saying, if a nuclear weapon can be activated by a UFO, then couldn't it be aimed at a civilian population? Couldn't it wipe out the entire country by just activating UFOs? Like if they can activate UFOs, how then how much further can they go with all this stuff? And the fact that none of this, nothing is ever done shows to me that they understand some degree of a uh, non-threatening behavior from the beings that, uh, and so I see a twist. I see kind of the, the, the kind of push and pull between between both cases uh, that there could be a threat and there could be a benevolent action going on here as well too, um, and that also is spoken with uh, you know Robert Eminger and Alan Sandler were apparently approached by the Pentagon to make and release a video on the public for creating awareness about extraterrestrials. So this happened as well too that they saw actual Air Force footage, and then they got retracted. So there was this attempt by the Pentagon to release information. They wanted to do it, and then they got cold feet about it. And Tom DeLong, right? He was on Joe Rogan's podcast, and his uh, his quote about how he got to work so close with the with the Pentagon uh, is shocking, actually. And it says also their intentions overall. He said the only way you meet with these people, the only way you can have anyone talk to you, is if you can provide a service that they need. And my service was pretty interesting to them because I said you guys struggle with saying disclosure. You want to tell everybody everything, and then you say, and then you say they, the public, can't handle it, so you don't tell them anything. And I'm like, there's a middle road, and here's how I would do the middle road, and it resonated with them. So that's pretty fascinating. And Tom, Tom DeLong uh, is part of the reason why uh, those videos got released uh, from ATIP, and uh, and and how he was able to kind of create a show and make them so public. So it's very fascinating. The end. So clearly, there's a force that wants information out, and there's a force that sees it as a threat. <clears throat> okay. So this is the, this is my my personal opinion. Um, I'm an amateur, by the way. So if you disagree, don't get angry. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a professional by any means. Uh, these are just my opinions. Um, so, but this is my opinion about what's going on. So what's, what's here, here I had this contact event where the beings explained, you know, these kind of errors of our ways, like the, the real, we've kind of, we kind of erred, we kind of got lost, if you will, the human species has gotten kind of got lost. So um, I look back at history and I can, you know, actually being fascinated by history myself, having past lives and having to been and studied history then, um, I have some perspectives about history and, and the human species in general. So I'm, I felt that this was a fun place to share this. So could it be that we had a, messed up, a misstep in our a human evolution? When one looks at our human history, it is easy to see where we may have gone wrong. So after the fall of the Roman Empire in the fifth century, the Catholic Church slowly became the dominant power in Europe. 
the Christian religion became the voice for human spirituality with the majority of the people living in the Middle Ages believing in the church. Now, I specifically focus on the Christian religion because the Western world is the, is the colonial mind frame uh, that we've basically used. We have the colonial mind frame and that all originated in Europe and then all originated in the Middle Ages. So it's this, we're, we're kind of this, uh, we're this watered down version of this ancient history. And it's really what our personal perspective comes from, the colonial perspective. <clears throat> so, it could be argued today that the Christian religion is not a complete picture of human spirituality. I will admit that in all human religions, I do believe are higher spiritual truths and power and wisdom. I, I, I love the Bible. I love Jesus. I love, uh, I, I love the test, uh, the, the Torah. I love the Bhagavad Gita. I think these are, I think these are powerful, powerful books. I think all religions have power to them. Um, but in, but there is sometimes confusion about spirituality within religions and interpretations are often within a geopolitical and historical context. The Catholic church was no exception to this, often demonizing or moralizing extrasensory experience so while claiming the existence of a dimension of punishment, right? I.E. hell to force the population to be good and follow commandments. With the lack of education throughout the Middle Ages, most people relied on the church to read and interpret the Bible, as well as interpret any spiritual experience they may have had for themselves. So you see this obvious twist and contortion. You can, especially in the era of these beings and the type of spiritual experiences, psychic abilities, all these random things that are coming up now that people can have. And there's a lot of information now the world has, even in the New Age or even even in, in collective spiritual and collective religions that people can. Uh, deepen their spiritual experience that they could never do in their in human history. So it's uh, you, it, that has to be taken into context that we are able to do this now, and that we had a history where we had this capability that we didn't that was dominated by power structures that 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 changed that for us. So by mid millennia, so around the 15 and 1600s, uh, religion and science were actually pretty close with each other. A lot, I don't know if a lot of people know that. Many famous scientists are actually, uh, Sir Isaac Newton was inspired by God to do what he did to find gravity, to find, uh, <clears throat> to use prisms to find color, to find the color spectrum. He was thinking he was exploring God. So it was very tight religion between science and religion. Um, also Roger Bacon, the mathematician, just a couple of two examples to give example there. But as science gave away to new understandings outside the realm of the church, the religious authorities began denouncing science. So you started having this push and pull. And basically it's because they were creating knowledge about the world outside the Bible. So in retaliation, science began quickly denouncing the Bible. They kind of, there's a period uh, in the period of enlightenment that they call the age of enlightenment where or the age of reason that the, tr the science actually started to constructively attack the Bible. And, uh, and they did it on purpose to, to, to undermine the authority. When the age of enlightenment began in the 1600s, it was rooted in undermining the authority of the Catholic church and the monarchy. It was a revolution against religious thinking that had dominated, previously dominated and scientific exploration. So that's valid, right? That's very valid. Most attribute the beginning of the age of enlightenment to René, De René Descartes, uh, his quote, I think, therefore I am. His philosophy among others of this period began the age of reason. But I believe, I'm an amateur here, but I believe in, it is in these acts of rebellion that formed our world's current problems. Now, Descartes couldn't be any more wrong. So it's these type of thinking that really seems to screw up our kind of evolution as it is. Because it's not, I think, therefore I am. It is, I am, therefore I think. It's a fundamental change in, in our inner perception and in, in what and who the human, what and who the human is. We are a heart and a being and a consciousness with a source. This is our spirit. And this is not a philosophy. This is the, see, the, the problem that's happened here is that it's become a personal, uh, spirituality has become a personal philosophy for people. It's something that you do privately on the side of your everyday waking life. But there are some things that when you explore that personal reality, it doesn't become a personal reality. It becomes the reality. It's the nature of the universe is these spiritual experiences you can have. And so it's not a personal philosophy. That, that alone, that, that should just be showing there's a problem here, right? We called this thing a personal thing. No, it's you. You think that there's a spirit, but I can tell you there's no spirit. And you have these other sides kind of arguing it. But the reality is that if a person can have these experiences and prove them to themselves, and hundreds of thousands of millions of people can do that, 
um, then we should be having larger questions about the nature of reality in general. But you don't have that. You have this side that kind of says, it's your personal choice to do that. And we get to all kind of have our own thoughts about it. But that doesn't make sense because if it's the nature of reality, we should probably all be on the same page with the nature of reality. I yeah, can't say, well, your reality is your reality. My reality is my reality. You yeah, it's know, like, I you need water. I don't need water. That's my reality. No, you need water, man. There's a there's facts about the nature of reality here. You need air, right? <laughs> you right. like you need sun. There's you some facts. You believe in gravity. I don't believe in gravity. Or... Exactly, right? Yeah. You think yeah. there is flat? That's okay. There is flat for you, and it's spherical for me. We can share the world. Yeah, we can. Yeah, <laughs> except I don't know how you think. Yeah, except where does the water go? <laughs> like, how do the clouds stay on? Like, whatever, man. <laughs> yeah, and you got it. And there's some this we've we've accepted some kind of weird part of our psyche, especially in the present society where people have different opinions and they're just calling the opinions, but we've really screwed something up here and it's really obvious kind of what's happening. So um, when we think, yeah, <clears throat> yeah, so this is not a philosophy. So this is a fact that the, the, that you can have these kind of extrasensory experiences. You can, this this nature of, that there is a, a higher nature to the to consciousness alone. Um, and so we have a source in which we think from. And when we think, when we think we use, oh, sorry, when we think we use the source power to think. In essence, we need to be treating thoughts as something that we are responsible for. Again, our makeup, we are, we are humans are such a reactionary beings, but the truth is we actually are choosing a lot of the choices of perception on the inside. We're making choices about how, what we want to perceive and we are so conditioned into those choices. We don't really realize, realize their choices anymore. So when people say they get angry or people, uh, people don't believe in having an unlimited potential. These are all choices that they've made long time ago and they buried those choices in their subconscious. So we've kind of forgotten and don't realize this is the nature of how humans create their world. So the age of enlightenment changed fundamental philosophical approaches to life. Instead of once holistic thinking, where the phenomenal world was seen as a web of interconnectedness, as God as the overarching intelligence, now the world became about individual sciences, analyzing one part, understanding it, sorry, understanding it and cataloging it without recognizing the integration of the entire whole. An example, so every science you can do this with. You can do this with every single science. Every single science analyzes, takes apart and isolates uh, uh, something away from its holistic perspective. And, and you're finding in the, in the modern era that there's a lot of sciences now that try to bridge those things. But in the individual era, they were not created. The whole perspective was always to analyze, go in and rip apart. And so for examples of this is the medical field uh, where you have, or so an example, yeah, the medical field where often mental illness is diagnosed as a brain problem without anybody or without at the time, people really trying to understand the role of thoughts in the brain. So you have these kind of separate disjointed pieces. Um, also illness, right? Illness is, we only think about illness as a terms of a problem of the body and don't understand any, uh, anything with the power of the mind in the process of creating illness. So there's, we've, that just as a small example, uh, what would be, what would be a holistic perspective, we've ripped apart and then analyzed it and said, this is the nature of the universe. The nature of the world is all these separate pieces that, that do come together on their own, but aren't holistically connected. Now, now we're in an era in the whole, the whole wellness, the whole wellness field is driven off of holistic perspective, which is that you are an interconnected species, but the entire thing is like this. The society is like this and we treat society broken too. We treat economics as one thing. We treat education as another. We treat them all kind of as separate pieces that we hope go together, but ne don't necessarily do go together. And that, that is the problem. <laughs> this is the problem. This is, this is that era, this, this era created this thinking for us. Then we kind of ripped apart everything. It, it, shouldn't a society be integrated with its economy? Shouldn't a society be integrated with its education? Shouldn't a society be integrated with the needs of the people? Shouldn't a society be integrated with politics? It's not integrated in any way. So you have all these separations creating out, and then these separations create all the problems. So if you had holistic thinking about each, each system built into to support one another, you would not have the issues we're having right now. But and in many ways, as the being said, it's kind of like too late. It's like the system's already there. There's billions of people supported by it. It's kind of run amok now. And we're kind of, we're in this kind of problem with it all. Um, so truths, oh, another feature to this period of, of, of uh, the way that the age of enlightenment altered 
our philosophical thinking, uh, that truths also had to be proven. So as science was rapidly showing that truths no longer thought to be believed were being replaced with scientific understanding, reason became greater than God. So you literally had a whole a whole slew of society uh, backing away from kind of this, any, if there is any wisdom to gain from a society that believes in a God, you're removing that, that wisdom out. And now you're just saying it has to be proven and there has to be a reason. And the reason that that is uh, <coughs> a problem is because now we live in a historical framework where that logic, reason, and the scientific mind dominates our worldview. And in it, we eradicated the actual other parts of our mind that we need. So mythology is, dude, people think they don't think they need mythology. Every, every TV show you're interested in is, is interacting with your depth of your, myth, of your own personal mythology. You, you have intuition and there's no, there's no system in our society that supports that. And we, you have individual wisdom. Every single one of us does. And no one, no one in, in your world, no system helps you explore your own personal wisdom. So we have these parts of our society and parts of our consciousness that are real, that are true, that have been eradicated out by, by our own historical evolution as a species, as a creature. And uh, so the result is they've been taken out of our society and their choices, go ahead. You can do that if you want, but they're not necessities. <coughs> and so you have this kind of rift that's created. And this for me is, is the obvious rift that's going on. So my last piece, is it possible that the nature of the universe, sorry, is it possible that the nature of civilizations throughout the galaxy is evolution of their spiritual wisdom and understanding alongside their technological advancements? And that we are the odd ones out and that it is normal for society to be spiritual that the nature of the universe is spiritual. And in essence, we have done something truly dangerous. We've evolved our technological spirit, our technology separate from wisdom, from collective thinking and from spirituality. So is it apparent to me that, <clears throat> that I think this is the kind of ultimate message I come to about my experience with the beings and kind of this, this overarching message. It isn't a message that you or anybody needs to become to think about spirituality it's about you individually it's about you coming to your own spirituality it's about it's not about you learning that that the beings are saying you need to be more spiritual it's about learning to come to your own spirituality and i actually do i'm convinced that most people can't understand these beings unless they come to their own sense of spirituality what it means that they that they can exist forever that they actually have a body that dissolves yet they have an electric a light body what does that mean to you individually what does it mean to you that you can be exposed through telepathy that someone can read your thoughts and feelings and that your true depth can be communicated uh and what you need out of your true depths like there's so much it means for the the psyche of a human that these are that these things are are very real, and uh, and so it's about you and your true depth about what's uh, about what's true for you and your spirituality, and uh, so that's what I think this overarching message is really all about. So just kind of last piece to my thesis here, um, as I mentioned, spirituality, nature, and collective thinking. I think they're all intertwined, and I think this is this is kind of the overarching message. Uh, it almost seems like you could say the same thing, wisdom, mythology, and intuition, kind of all intertwined, all holistic, all interconnected, all needed. And then you have this, uh, uh, in a future contact event, the elder will say to me, and I'll, I'll do a presentation on that event, that they want the people to, who are going to be here in the future who will be on the planet to be kind, spiritual, and peaceful. So it seemed like a nice piece to the nice piece of the puzzle that uh, I was given some of that information about what they're kind of looking for the future there. And uh, the last piece is what thinking, what is the real mind frame that I'm really thinking about here? It's what they call the indigenous worldview. So um, just so I'm, I'm not hoping, not offending anybody or general, creating generalizations. I took that indigenous worldview from <clears throat> right here. So it came from this website here, uh, and uh, it was basically a summary about the Indigenous worldview written by Indigenous people. So I, I, it was I, the basic premise is is holistic thinking, and I think, you know, some people like ask weird questions like, why would the beings create crop circles, right? These and crop circles are really weird, right? They're like okay, if even if you do believe that that, that they're created by the beings, why crop circles? Why are you doing it on these weird fields that? humans can sometimes say 
Maybe that was done by a person. Maybe, and they kind of just toss it off. Oh, that weird, very complex thing done overnight that you would that's warped into the land in weird ways. But when you look at it from the sky, is is perfectly shaped. Like maybe that was done by a human. But but what society wouldn't toss that off? What type of people? What type of collective consciousness would people have when they'd see a crop circle like that and stop everything? Right. The indigenous worldview, people who are indigenous by nature would actually stop everything and say, we're being communicated with people. We need to listen to this. What is this message? And in their minds, I know the beings literally think we've been communicating with you. Why aren't you listening? They're literally saying that you're the ones not listening. And there is a worldview. It's our scientific mind that has said, mm, nope, not good enough, right? Not good enough, not good enough. Not, I, I need more proof. I need more better. I need better. I need I need a hard physical evidence. I need you to give me an alien in a tube. And to the fact that you had that experience means nothing. I need an alien in a tube and da, da. So you get this hard and rifting science. You get these rifting problems in our, in our mentality that make us not listen to some of the things that have been going on. And there is a perspective in which we would have listened and we have eradicated that from our, from our collective consciousness. So that's my overarching thesis. And, uh, and I think the beings actually have uh, indigenous archetypes in them. I think archetypes are kind of Carl Jung's concept of archetypes is very normal in the universe. I'm convinced of this. And the beings have indigenous archetypes in them. And, uh, and, and so an indigenous worldview would have taken messages like that seriously and stopped everything and tried to understand what the messages were. So, okay, man, that's very it. Good. Very good.